praise the Lord. I want to give this opportunity to invite my friend, mighty man of God, director of one uh, of the oldest mission, uh, I believe works here in Michigan. He oversees um, a ministry that touches lives, homeless, homelessness, mental problems, name it. And uh, that is how we met. I used to, before I established through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, VMI, I was doing a teaching at one of his facilities uh, on Woodward and Davidson. Um, there was one former director before he came on board. So when he came on board, I was informed about, about him. And finally, we met him click. I'm like, what a brother. He has a very long resume. Yeah, his degree is in, I believe, journalism. Uh, but he's done a lot and become a minister. And I just, uh, we, I'm just very, very uh, glad that the Lord would have this man um, to be speaking his word for us today. So I want us to be ready. And I want all of us to, with the, I'll say, uh, wait, a hand of applause. Let's invite Rev to the platform. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. The floor Amen. is yours. Yes, but the Lord our God deserves all the honor, all the glory, all the power. And he is forever good. He's forever awesome. And it's a wonderful opportunity to be with you once again. And I had a wonderful opportunity to be with my brother earlier in the week. And whenever we meet, we encourage each other. We pray, uh, we talk about scriptures and how our ministry is going. And he's always a source of inspiration. I like his perseverance. I like his true to his calling. Uh, some, he, uh, I think I had that word, compromise. Some do uh, along the way, uh, compromise just to blend. Uh, but he has uh, remained steadfast in his calling. Uh, and that's, uh, that should serve as a source of encouragement to all of us who are uh, observing him, and particularly those of you who regularly sit under his teaching. Uh, as I was uh, uh, coming, you know, he told me just just uh, share what the Lord has laid uh, on your heart to share, and that's what I'm going to do. And, and, and when I do that, I I tend to before I speak, I tend to look for a confirmation uh, from uh, things that people say, uh, songs that they. Uh, they share, uh, the minister, uh, and I had him say something about, uh, you know, before you get things, some, sometimes you have to go through somebody who knows somebody and things like that. And, and, and that uh, caught at the heart of, of what uh, I believe the Lord uh, laid on me to share today, which is this concept of destiny helpers. Um, uh, I, he, I, I've heard a lot of the uh, things that he said in, uh, along those lines. And so I feel that I've received the confirmation uh, to, to go on uh, to speak on that same subject. But I, I'm going to be looking at it from a different perspective uh, today based on scripture. Uh, whenever we hear of destiny helpers, we always uh, imagine kind individuals um, who come uh, along our way and they provide vivid support and encouragement 
and many a time people think only in terms of somebody who gives you money, somebody who connects you to a job, somebody who, who provides material help. And of course, material help is good, uh, but I, I see uh, two types of, of divine helpers, uh, destiny helpers. I see the mindful ones and the ones that are unmindful. And, and you may qualify them as the kind ones and the unkind ones. But as I say that, I'm reminded of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that says all things, all things, not some things, not few things, all things work together for good. Mm -hmm. and, and, but but the, it says for us who, who trust God, for us who have subscribed to the leadership of Jesus Christ, for us who call him Lord and Savior, all things work mm -hmm. together for our good. All yeah. things. And when he says all things, you, you can, of course, put in that context the things that you think are good and the things that you think are, are bad. When, when you, you look back, you can see how God used those things that you think are bad. And sometimes those people that you think are bad to shape you, to put you in alignment with his will, to get you to move closer to that destiny that he has laid for you. And, and, and we're going to look at two people. I'm going to focus mostly on the unmindful destiny helpers, the people that don't look like destiny helpers, but they are indeed people who are going to help us to accomplish the purpose that God has set for us. Now, let me just uh, cast our mind on a few uh, positive, so to speak, mindful uh, destiny helpers, and I'm sure they, they, they resonate. Uh, if you uh, think of Paul, I, I was speaking one day at the church, and I, the church is St. Paul's, and I told them, uh, for purposes of my sermon, I would ask the permission of the bishop to momentarily rename the church St. Barnabas. And, and everybody kind of, and I, and I said, there were this, this, the ministry of Paul had a lot of support from the ministry of Barnabas. But Saul was the one who grew and wrote one third of the New Testament to the, the gospel to four continents. And so we, we, his name resonates. We talk a lot about Saul, about Saul, but Barnabas was there, provided a strong support to Paul. But before Barnabas, before Barnabas, there was an Ananias. And the Bible tells us about him in Acts chapter nine. Just, we didn't get more, a lot of information about him. Just said this disciple in, this disciple in, in Damascus, was asked to go and minister to Paul. Paul was then blind. He was uh, in a house, ask us. Then enters the picture. Ananias was the one who guided him through the early stages of ministry. Ananias was, he was blind. Ananias was the one who laid hands on him and he was by revelation. God instructed him, go to him. And there was confirmation. After the Mount of two or three witnesses shall everyone be established. Saul had seen in a dream that Ananias was going to come. Ananias came and helped him to begin that journey. Ananias was the one who really put it in context about his ministry. And he began from there on. So if you talk about positive, mindful, kind destiny helpers, you should put Ananias in that column. He knew what he was doing. That what he was doing was to advance the purpose of Paul. God placed him in that role and he played it well. Ananias, very good uh, uh, person uh, to mention. Now, okay, he, the Bible described him as a disciple. So he had good, good resume. He had good, uh, a good profile. But what about Rahab? Uh, Rahab, is somebody that you may not, um, uh, well, we're gonna talk about Rahab in terms of, of the, the mindful, uh, mindful person who, who did that with the clear intent of being part of the process 
of bring advancing the purpose for a nation. For how it was for a nation, there were two spies involved. But just the um, just let's keep there. You know, Naomi. Some people say Naomi. They say it was root to Naomi, but I like to believe it was more of Naomi being a destiny helper to root. Uh, you know the story. Naomi guided root toward becoming the forebear of Jesus Christ. Root was the one who became the great grandmother of Jesus Christ, and it was through the mentorship, through the guidance of her mother-in-law. The husband was, was, was dead. The woman guided her, do this and do that. What do you call her? She was a destiny helper. She was a destiny helper. Rahab, I mentioned before, was a destiny helper. Rahab, not complimentary resume. You know, she was a, a woman of easy virtue, right? <laughs> she, but what did she do? She saw a moment. She knew Jordan was going to be history. She knew it would be defeated by, by Israel. And she chose, she chose to side with Israel. It was very deliberate. I mean, the account is so clear. She deliberately sided with Israel. She harbored, she gave safety to the two spies. But she made a request. I know what you guys are here for. I know there's going to be victory. I know we are losing. We're going to lose. But I want to be part of you. I want to be part of you. Now, the nation of Israel is what we're talking about here. The spies were like ambassadors. They represented a whole nation. And this woman made herself a vessel for the advancement of the purpose of the nation of Israel. She sided with them. And so she was a positive, a mindful, a kind destiny helper. Remember, I'm looking at two, two types of destiny helpers. Right. The mindful ones who are deliberately joining forces with you to bring about the purpose of God in your life. Mm -hmm. It's deliberate. They know what they are doing. They know the the outcome of their involvement, they choose to be part of your progress. They identify with your journey. And you can see them along the way. You can see that we do encounter them. And many a time we are so in tune when we hear of Destiny Helper, all we think about are those people. They have a very important role to play. They have a very important role to play. The mindful Destiny Helper is part of your job. God brings them and places them on your path as you move toward accomplishing the purpose for which he brought you here. But then we have this group, the unmindful destiny helpers. Those who will think they are hurting you, they are undermining you, they are bringing you down, they're pushing you aside, but by so doing, they are actually helping you to accomplish the purpose that God has for you. Amen. We don't usually think about them when we focus on destiny helpers. It's always about the ones who are doing good, the good that we can see. And so today, we're going to look at three, three, just three persons. I mean, I can go on and on about this, but, but, but we're going to look at three individuals or more, and, and I see them performing three, you know, that's, I, I describe them in, in three words. A, a, a subset do that because they are fearful. The fearful, unmindful destiny helpers. They are fearful. They are driven by fear. And as a, a consequence of that is jealousy. They are driven mm -hmm. by fear. Mm -hmm. they, they see where you're going. They, you know, or they see the potentials. They may not see the whole picture. But if they see that, hey, this guy, this guy could be somebody. 
-hmm. This ministry could be something. Mm -hmm. So why don't I bring it down? Why don't I nip it in the board? Why don't I suppress it? And we don't think about them as helping us accomplish what God has in store for us, right? Let's talk about Joseph. Let's talk about Joseph. Joseph is a perfect example of somebody who was helped by unmindful, he encountered unmindful destiny, destiny helpers. People who helped him without knowing they were helping him. Amen. People who, by hurting him, helped him. They thought they were hurting him, but they were helping him. And to really, really capture this, just to put it in a way that makes it so clear, I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 45 from verse 4 to verse, verse 5. Genesis 45, 4 to 5. And I'll read. Genesis, I will go there, then we go back from the beginning. We're talking about Genesis here. But let's go to, to, the, to the, this is the summit of the whole journey with his brothers. The, the point where he revealed himself to them. And they were feeling guilty, you know, but listen to what Joseph said, Genesis 45, 4 to 5. He revealed himself saying, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. I'm reading from New King James Version. Mm -hmm. I go over it again. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Why did they sell, sell him into Egypt? Because he was always talking about his vision, the dreams he had, what the future was going to look like. And they were so jealous of him. And they, they came to the conclusion one day, hey, the best thing to do, let's cut this crap. Let's just sell the guys, the guy to these guys who are coming over. Whatever they do with him, that's up to him. But that will end it all. When we sell him, the chapter is closed. Nobody will be tormenting us with his dreams anymore. We will not be fearful anymore of his supremacy. He wouldn't be, he wouldn't power above us. Once we sell him, it's over. So he reminded them, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, I, that phrase there, I could, I could do lots of teachings on but now. The, the, the past was about selling him off. The past was about enslavement. The past was about hatred. The past was about fear. The past was about jealousy. Right. But now, he tells us two sides, the past and the present. Now and the past. Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself. Because, watch this, you sold me here. For God, don't be angry because you sold me here. This is where I'm going. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Mm -hmm. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Now, they were his brothers were perfect, unmindful destiny helpers, mm -hmm. driven by fear. They were fearful of the possibilities that Joseph pre presented. They were fearful of his ascendancy. They were fearful of what he could become. They were fearful of the meaning of his dreams. Mm -hmm. They thought it was over. But God knew. God knew the, the end from the beginning. And when they sold him, he would end up in an elevated position in Egypt. Yeah. And they, having been struck with famine, we end up going there for survival. Not everyone who is against you is sent by the devil. <laughs> Not everyone who hates you. This was part of God's plan. It unfolded that way. And guess what? 
it was part of God's redemption plan for Israel. Mm -hmm. They had to go into Egypt. They had to come out of Egypt. And Joseph was the conduit. Just, and his brothers were the facilitators. They thought they hated him. They thought, hey, they were done with him. But guess what? No. They didn't understand what was going on. They were helping to bring about the purpose of God for Israel using Joseph. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everyone that is against you, they may have ill intent toward you. You know, we have a way of always praying, you know, and that's good. It's good to pray against things. Oh, God, bring me out of this situation. Bring me out of this situation. You know, you can pray and bring you out of it. But what in that situation was intended to bring you to a better situation? What if you were meant to go through that situation, not come out of it, go through it? So that by going through it, you are equipped for the place that God is taking you. What if through, through people abandoning you? What if through people rejecting you? What if the whole idea was to make you to depend entirely on God? Well, you say, no, 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 I don't want to be rejected now. Just, Father, get me out of it right now, right now. And you pray and pray and pray. God can say, okay. You want, you want to end it? No problem. Let me get you out of it. But you've denied yourself the opportunity to benefit from it, to position and equip yourself for the next chapter of that destiny of yours. But what God does, being a God of second chance and third chance, and you know, he, he gets us around to a similar situation. That's why people see repetition, they keep going in and in and because they've not sat down to ask God, what is, what is this about? Tell me what this thing, that, this place I'm in, what is it all about? What, what is the purpose? What, what, why am I here? Why am I in this situation? What do you want me to get out of this situation? What is the lesson you want me to learn from this situation? The Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Knowing this, that a trial of your faith, walk at patience. The trial of your faith develops that character of God in you, which is patience. Amen. In Galatians 5.22, the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and you find patience there. Some circumstances we find ourselves in are setting us up for victory. They are setting us up for elevation. They are setting us up to move to the next phase of our destiny. Joseph's brothers were unmindful destiny helpers. Joseph's brothers. He, 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 he laid it bare, Genesis 45, 4 to 5. Remember, we, we've talked about the, the, the usual references about people who are kind, who are clement, you know, and we are looking at people who don't, on the surface, uh, appear to be helpful. We see them uh, naturally as hurtful people. Of course, they're hurting us. But you look at what is the outcome? What is the impact of that whole process? What is the end game? What is, what, what, what is this leading us to? Another person we're going to look at. And again, it, it, it looks contrarian. It doesn't, you know, Joseph's story, of course, you can find it in, 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 in Genesis 37. That's where the whole thing began. Now, but Joseph was sold into Egypt. The favor of God was going with him. The presence of God was going with him everywhere he went. The Bible is very clear on that. Genesis chapter 39. He finds himself in the house of Potiphar, an official in Egypt, a highly placed guy. Favor, he was a slave, mind you. He was a servant, but an elevated servant that Potiphar trusted him with everything, gave him authority over everything in his household. Yes. He was still a slave. But he was an elevated slave. He was a slave with, with authority. He could, he could make decisions. He could 
I mean, like in corporate world, we talk about you know executive positions. We talk about you know managerial supervisors, you know supervisors that are managers. There are people who are in executive positions. They can make decisions for managers to implement. The guy, as far as Potiphar's household was concerned, Joseph was the guy. But that's what should, what happened next. The Bible says day after day, day after day, in one of the prayers I, that we prayed today, we were talking about this kind of thing, you know, immorality and all that. The woman kept trying to seduce him day after day. The Bible is very clear on that. Genesis 39, day after day, sleep with me, day after day, you know, that's the, if you want happiness, this is the way to happiness. You want promotion? This is the way to promotion. Just sleep with me and everything is done. You know, it sounded, sounded attractive, sounded <laughs> like a sure bet. You know, just, you know, she's the master's wife. What well, the Bible says, Joseph resisted every step of the way. Joseph resisted every step of the way. Wow. Joseph resisted every step of the way. One day, he was about, do, about doing his business. He was doing his normal business in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife showed up. Hey, you got to do it today. Today or no other day. You can't escape from me. No other person is here. Just two of us. Now. The Bible says quickly, Joseph ran away. But the woman had his cloak. And his cloak was evidence that she could use against him. Hey, he tried to rape me. He came here to mock me. He, and he, you know, she, she painted him so bad. So bad. Of course, you know, a man announced it to everybody. He announced it to everybody. And when the man came, Potiphar came, he said, oh, see this Hebrew. All of you know, Hebrew came to the picture. This Hebrew you brought, you know, this slave you brought here and gave him all these big positions, you gave him authority. See what he tried to do. But the, Joseph had told this woman, My master, I, I could do anything. He gave me authority over everything except one thing you. His wife, I will not. I will not. But what was the woman's account? Hey, the Hebrew came here. See, you gave him authority. See, all he wanted to do with that authority was to do this. Trust men, you know, I'm a man. <laughs> the man got angry. <laughs> got so pissed off. Put him in, in prison. That's the, you know, hey, that's where he belongs. He tried to sleep with my wife. He has to end up in, in jail. So there, Joseph went. And there, the favor of God remained with Joseph. He was in prison, but God never left him, never abandoned him. He was in prison. He never parted ways with his sense of loyalty, his sense of duty, his sense of integrity, his sense of dedication. Is the Lord is God. Yes. Even in prison, Joseph remained true to himself. Joseph remained true to his convictions. Joseph did not compromise. Even in prison, even in the worst of situations, Joseph remained Joseph in jail. Yeah. Yeah. Favor found him again because the presence of God was with him. The person who was in charge of the prison elevated Joseph. Just as he was elevated in the house of Potiphar, Potiphar, even in prison, he was elevated. But he was still in prison. And he wanted to get out of prison. But the prison was for a purpose. It was through the prison that he would become the prime minister of Egypt. I have always told people. I have not known of an account of God uh, lifting people and placing them on top of the mountain. I have always known from scriptural authority that the pathway 
to the top of the mountain is the valley. You go on that journey, and then you get to the peak of the mountain. And along the way, you learn survival skills. Along the way, you learn patience. Along the way, you get just as we learn of Moses. Moses was a prince, prince of Egypt. There, of course, every of his needs was met. But when he left and became a servant to his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, he was rearing animals all over the place for 40 years. And along the way, he was acquiring some skills. He was gaining some experiences that will come to bear in the process of taking the people of Israel from Egypt, where they were set free to the promised land. The only one amongst the Israelites who had a wilderness experience, who had experience of that region, because the people were staying in Egypt, they stayed in Goshen, they stayed there, was, was this guy. How did he get it? It was not as, he was a prince. Then he became a servant. The 40 years experience as a servant served him well as a leader as of the people of Israel as they went, as they traveled to the promised land. I don't want to go into details of that. This guy, Joseph, we're still talking about him. Joseph was still in prison. But the presence of God was there with him. The gifts and callings of God that are without repentance were still in manifestation in his life. One day, two servants of Pharaoh dreamt the chief butler and the chief baker. They were there. They dreamt. And the opportunity popped up for Joseph once again. He, being somebody who, you know, he observed them. They didn't come up and tell him about the, the dreams. He asked them. I said, you guys, your countenance is sad. What's going on? Tell me what's going on. You know, we need to be checking our brothers and sisters. Sometimes you don't know what's happening to people. I had when Dick, the Dickiness was talking about, you know, call people up. You got to call. You don't know what's going on. They may not tell you unless you ask them. And he asked them, what's going on? You see your faces, of course, you know, you would say, you would say somebody who's in prison shouldn't be happy, you know, I understand that, but he asked them and it shared with him the dreams they had. Same night, they had two dreams. Of course, the gifts and callings of God kicked in. Joseph interpreted their dreams for them. But he told he made a request, please, I'm not supposed to be here. I was sold into slavery by my brothers and I was brought out of jail for no offense. When you get out of here, he told the chief baker, your dream means you'll be restored. You go back to what you used to do, but the chief baker, your dream, you'll be killed. So to the chief baker, to, to the chief butler, who will be restored, he said, please help me get out of here, right? The guy got out, was restored, back to normalcy, he forgot, he forgot. But time came, the opportunity came, the purposes of God must be accomplished. There might be delay. There might be delay, but it took 20 years, about 20 years for Esau and Jacob to be born after marriage. I mean, Rebecca was, was in marriage for about 20 years um, without having a, a children, 20 years. And, 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 and God had promised blessings to Abraham and, and to Isaac, and right? But the woman for 20 years. Sometimes there might be delays, and we might run out of patience, we might you know, cry, high heavens, and no, God is still 
working things out. God is still in charge. God is still walking, laying, preparing you for what he wants accomplished in your life. So one day, guess what? That same butler, that same butler who forgot, opportunity came and he remembered. He couldn't forget anymore. He couldn't forget anymore. He was forced to remember that the only one who could give interpretation to the kings, to Pharaoh's dream, was this guy who is in jail. That moment when those who have, have forgotten what they promised you, what they are supposed to do to you, for you, that moment will come. That moment will come. They can't help it. Their forgetfulness will cease. Your gift will make room for you, will make way for you. That, you cannot hide pregnancy. Pregnancy, yeah. a woman who's pregnant, the, the stomach will protrude. When it's time for delivery, it happens. When it's time for you to be announced, when it's time for the person who forget, forgot to remember, it will happen. Amen. All you need to do, as Joseph was, was to keep, keep trusting the Lord, keep fellowshipping with the Lord, keep looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Amen. So at the end of the day, hey, Joseph moved from someone hated by his brothers. His brothers became unmindful destiny helpers. <laughs> from there to Potiphar's wife, who became an unmindful destiny helper by falsely accusing him and, and forcing the husband to throw Joseph into, into prison. Then the chief butler became another destiny helper, mindful of it. And Joseph ended up becoming the prime minister of Egypt. Remember I talked about Joseph's brothers as being guided by fear fearfulness? They were fearful. <laughs> this second group, I call the fickle, they are the fickle, unmindful destiny helpers. They're just fickle. They blow hot today, they blow cold tomorrow. You know, today, Potiphar's wife saw him as, oh, you know, he's a handsome guy. He's, you know, the next day, he hate, she hated him. The, the butler, oh, oh, you know, let's help me. Nice. The next day, he forgot. Fickle. The fearful, the fickle. Then there's a last group. You know, Rebecca, I talked about Rebecca a while ago. And there's this debate about Rebecca. You know, a lot of people, when you ask them about, you know, about Rebecca, they, they present Rebecca as, um, you know, a manipulator, right? A manipulator. And they present um, uh, Jacob. Jacob is always seen as, you know, the cheat, right? Okay, the, the circumstance of his birth uh, informed his name. In those days, that's how it works. You know, you, you know, there's somebody who's named Tuesday, the person was born on a Tuesday. Okay? But there's something that happened in the life of Jacob. I, I, I find a blend of those two types of destiny helpers in Jacob. The mindful ones and your mindful ones all converged to help J Jacob accomplish the purpose that God has set for him. What do I mean? The Bible says, Rebecca was barren. We use the word barren. Barren, that's what the Bible says, barren. For 20 years, you know, no issue. Isaac prayed, prayed for the wife. 
The wife became pregnant. But something was happening. She was very uncomfortable with the pregnancy. The, 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 the kids were fighting in her womb and all that. And she sought the Lord. The Bible says she didn't go to horoscope or she didn't go to Google. There was no Google then, of course. She didn't, but that's what we do today. We go to Google, we go to horoscope, we go to the psychic, we, you know, we go to all those. The Bible says she sought the Lord. She went, something was troubling her. She went to the Lord. And the Lord told her, clear cut revelation. Two nations are in your womb. Two nations. Two nations. The older one, the elder will serve the younger. Mm -hmm. That was a clear revelation. The Bible says it was given to Rebecca. Who interceded for Rebecca? The husband. Who received the revelation about the future? Rebecca. Fast forward. The kids were born. The Bible says Isaac loved Esau because Esau was a, you know, would go hunt and bring back. The father loved it, you know, men meet, meet love. And Rebecca loved Jacob, who used to live in tents. And the implication, maybe he wasn't that, uh, wasn't that person who, you know, in those days, you know, of course, even today, position of honor, there are things you do and people, the macho kind of stuff, and you go, you hunt, you again, you bring you home. You're the main, you're a real guy, you're the main guy. It's like I used to stay at home. It was mommy's boy, right? Amen. And this other guy was daddy's boy. He does the macho things. He goes, he hunts, he brings home. The daddy loved him. And when it was time for Isaac to die, he was senile, he was old. When it was time for him to die, he did something that was customary. He wanted to bless his son, his first son, Esau, to be precise. And he said, hey, Esau, come here. I want, you know how I used to like it? Just go hunt again, bring it, prepare it, and bring it, and then I will bless you. There's a, I'm going somewhere with this. Mindful and unmindful destiny helpers. The father, senile, was an unmindful destiny helper here. And so what, see what happened. He called Issa. Sent Esau out. Esau was making room. Esau previously had sold his birthright. And what's one thing about Joseph, Jacob? Jacob was a hard negotiator. Hard negotiator. You want this? You want this porridge? Hey, you got to give me this. I saw even in Bethel, when he named laws Bethel, Joseph was, Jacob was negotiating with God. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 28, it begins with, you know, he, it was night, he set a stone and he, he lay on the stone and there was, he dreamt of a ladder from heaven down, angels were ascending and descending and the Lord stood on top of, the, of, of it and, and said, hey, God pronounced great blessings on him, great blessings on him. Yet he woke up. What, what was the first thing he did? Oh, of course, I, I like what he did. The first thing he said, he anointed the place and says, ah, this is, this is awesome. The Lord is in this place and I didn't know. The Lord is here. This is the Lord's house. He was happy. It was the Lord's house. But the Bible said he was afraid because of what he saw. So she just opposed those. He was afraid because of the great dream that he had. But he was dutiful to pronounce the awesomeness of the presence of God. This is the Lord's house. This is better, he said. But then his personality came to the surface. He started negotiating with God. God, the God that, that told him, this land belongs to your offsprings. This land belongs to you. I've given it. You know, God pronounced blessings upon him. Yet, yet, Jacob started negotiating with God. If you will bring me back to my father's house, then you will be my God. Then I will give you a tenth of all you bless me with. If, if, if God had told him, this is not negotiable, I will bless you. 
But he was negotiating. That's the personality of Jacob. He negotiated so hard with his brother and got his butt better right. Is it that he's, uh, well, that's, what he, that's his personality. But on this day of blessing, you find a confluence of the unmindful destiny helper and a mindful destiny helper. Of the four persons in the room, in, in this whole scenario, there was just one mindful destiny helper, and it was Rebecca. Rebecca remembered the revelation of God. Isaac must have forgotten. He was senile. All he wanted to do was to do what was customary. Bless the first son. But the mom remembered the revelation of God. Two nations are in your womb. The elder one will serve the younger one. So she said, you know what? The purposes of God must come to pass. I won't allow Isaac to, um, to bless Esau when God said the, line, the line of promise goes through Jacob, not through Esau. He said, you know, okay, listen to me, Jacob. The father has sent Esau away. The father is an unmindful destiny helper because by sending Esau away, he created room for Jacob to come and receive the blessing. Listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. The blessing was to be for Jacob. That was the prophecy. A very clear cut prophecy. Rebecca was mindful of that prophecy. Rebecca knew that prophecy must come to pass. Rebecca knew it wasn't Esau. It was Jacob. Isaac wasn't mindful of that. Esau believed, hey, I'm the first son. He should be mine. But he had sold his battery. This hard negotiator negotiated with him to bequeath, to relinquish his battery. Are we legalistic here? Yes, he, he got it legally. But the prophetic has to start up. So you have the mom, Rebecca, being the mindful destiny helper of Jacob. With Isaac, who went to get hunt again, and the father who sent him, being unmindful destiny helpers. Imagine what would have happened if Esau was at home when Jacob brought the, the, the meal she prepared, he, she, the mom prepared to bring, what would have happened? So the, the scenario had to be such that Isaac would be away, uh, will be, of course, he's in his room, his chambers. Esau will be away. It has to be such that the woman, Rebecca, will eavesdrop and hear what's going on and prepare Jacob to step into that blessing that was ordained for him from time immemorial. There were two groups of people. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta round it up now, you guys are. But my, let me sum it up this way. Remember what, how I began Romans 8, 28. Mm -hmm. All things work together for good. Mm -hmm. All things work together for good. In whatever circumstance you find yourself, don't be quick to judge, hey, my enemies, are, the devil is trying to, no. Hear from God. Don't glorify the devil by always telling you, oh, he's the one, he's the, no. God may be using what the enemy planned. God can use anyone. In fact, the Bible says, if the devil understood the plan of salvation, <laughs> he wouldn't have crucified the Holy One of Israel. <laughs> the devil was used to, to bring about a salvation plan without knowing it. And they didn't tell him. Oh, let me tell you. No, no, no. He, it was hidden from him. Let's keep trusting God. The God who began that journey in us. Let's keep looking unto him, knowing that he's able, more than able, to take us to the finish line. And he can use anyone, any circumstance along the way to make us what he wants us to be.
he is more than able. Father, we thank you. We thank you because your faithfulness is from generation to generation. We thank you because you never change. You are faithful until the end. Thank you because that which you have proposed in our lives, you are able to bring it to pass. Yeah. Using all manners of people along the way. Let us trust you. Help us to trust you as we walk on this journey, knowing that you are able to make us what you want us to be. Be thou exalted, O Father, in the wonder-working name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we all say, Amen. 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 Uh, something quick before I uh, thank you so very much for having me. You and me at this time on, on the recording as well. Thank you so very much. One thing that was so, uh, you know, vivid was, you know, we always talk about how Rebecca. Something that it was Rebecca was fulfilling the prophecies which I've seen from that perspective until today. So much that it like Rebecca was helping Jacob to make a decision. She knew what she was doing. It was, again, uh, the revelation that uh, Isaac prayed, but the revelation came to Rebecca. And so, as you said, the uh, destiny, the mindful destiny, and an unmindful destiny both were comprised uh, in uh, uh, Jacob's uh, and there's a lot here that um, you, you talk about that we are uh, on social media for everybody watching again. Thank you so much for such a wonderful message today and one of the things that I want to bring to our attention uh, from I there's a lot here that you said but um, many times do we find ourselves in a situation instead of us just oh, so to ask God what do you want me to learn out of this? Yes, he said, yeah, prayer. And everybody, again, you know, on our unmindful destiny helper, we be doing that to help us unless we come to uh, uh uh, an realization in that position in our lives to say, Lord, this isn't comfortable, but there is something in which we belong, and what is that I should learn? And I want to thank you again so very much for that. I want to pause there.